Brenda, when was that memo sent round about pets in the office? The computer simply stores everything, whether it's useful or not. The clever part of human memory is really the forgetting bit. Our brains are constantly selecting what's worth remembering. Oh, no, wait. It wasn't it the same day I met Bruce, the fire officer? He was a pet and no mistake, yes! There it is. Splendid. Thank you, Brenda. The world's fastest mechanical brain. Misleading descriptions of computers stem from the 1950s when they were often referred to as giant brains. This indicator acts as the main control. Tape is fed in, tape that contains great masses of numerical data. The machine follows many of the patterns of man's own mind. Only the machine never goes in for daydreaming. In reality, these early computers were extraordinarily clumsy. This is a 1958 Pegasus, recently restored by the Computer Conservation Society. Instead of chips, it all works with valves. 1,800 of them, and they're all mounted on packages. And here's an example of a package from Pegasus. Three valves, old components. And uh, so it's like a sort of primitive printed circuit? Is it? Yes, this is an early form of printed circuit. To keep the valves cool, large amounts of air have to be blown through the computer, so it all has to be aerodynamically shaped, like a wind tunnel. And what we have to do first of all is to switch the HT on, and we press the HT button here, and that brings up the lines on the cathode ray tube here. And now we have to enter the instructions to start the engineer's test program. This is looking at the internal registers in the machine, and each of those little spikes there is an on-off bit within one register. So down is on, and up is off, and up is on. Is That's right? right, yes. Of course, you can also hear the um, engineer's test program playing on the loudspeaker down here. And having got a loudspeaker, there was an incentive for people to write tunes for the computer. And I can now load a tunes program in, and we have to load this on a paper tape reader oh, yeah. here. Yeah. And here's a tunes program punched on paper tape. And this we can load into Pegasus. And here we have the punch paper tape. So the holes are just like the holes in Hollerith punch cards. That's right, yes, idea. yes. And we load that into the reader here. And then uh, we start the program running. And that's now loading the paper tape in. Now we load the music program. And now we can start the tunes program running. And now you can see the bit patterns there on the screen. Of the individual notes. Yes. Writing programs on paper tape like this was very difficult. You didn't actually have to punch every individual hole. Instead, you used modified teletape machines like this. Each letter I press punches out a different combination of holes. Even so, it remains a, a very frustrating business because just one wrong key, and when the tape's transferred to the computer, the program won't run. Uh, as part of my engineering degree, I did a short computer course writing programs like this in 1970, and I don't remember ever getting a single program to run. The solution was to add a TV screen to the computer. This is one of the first computers to have one built in. It was introduced in 1969. Then, with uh, a special program called a line editor, if you put, ran this through the machine first, you could then write your own program, and see what you were doing, and make adjustments and try it out as you went along. These line editor programs were really the forerunner of the modern word processor programs. I suppose that some of you are wondering what that television screen device is and what it has to do with the office of today. That equipment is called the IBM 3277 display terminal. Through its keyboard, characters are typed and displayed on the screen. Should the operator make an error, the backspace key works just like an eraser on a pencil, and the error disappears. Displaying everything like this needed a lot of circuitry. What made it practical was to miniaturize it all. 
combining the transistors into the first integrated circuits or silicon chips. At first these were relatively simple. This is an example. If I put one light in the output and two in the inputs I can show you what it does. This is a comparing circuit. It switches the output on whenever the two inputs are the same as each other, either both off or both on. It switches the output off when only one input is lit. Even the simple comparing circuit can start to seem clever if it's working fast enough. I can put in one set of inputs the ASCII code for a letter A and compare it with the other set. The output will only switch on if the other set is another A. If I were to do this enough times, I could compare whole words. And this is the basis of sophisticated word processor spell checkers, comparing words that you've typed in with words that are stored in the computer's memory. This clock I made works entirely with these simple sorts of chips. You tell the time, the hours by the number of balls here and the minutes by the amount of sand that comes through the hourglass. The chips are inside the high priest's casket. It's his sort of box of mysteries. I usually decorate my circuits with tiny people. I like the idea of this sort of secret world which they're all keeping going. I use this clip-on meter to see what's actually going on inside the chips. That one's counting the seconds. Uh, this one's sort of storing various holding circuits, storing the current time. Well, although I've had quite a lot of trouble keeping the, um, getting the mechanisms to work reliably, none of the chips have ever gone wrong. It's the extraordinary reliability of chips that's made it possible to build them more and more complicated. The modern microprocessor chip is almost a complete computer in itself. It controls all the other chips inside the computer. But although it's very complex, it's still built up of thousands of transistor switching circuits and uh, it works by doing a lot of very simple things extremely quickly. Uh, we've uh, soldered a whole lot of lights onto this microprocessor and uh, I insert this one. Oops. Switch the computer on. I've now rigged this one up so that I can slow it down and you can now actually see the bits of code moving around inside. These are either the coded letters or the instructions of what to do with them. Of course, in reality, this is actually switching at millions of times a second. Word processors could have remained highly expensive rarities, except for the dedicated hobbyists who started devising and selling personal computer kits made from microprocessor chips. The By the early 80s, companies like Sinclair and Amstrad had started to sell ready-built personal computers. Many came complete with their own word processor programs. ...and inclusive word processing software. It's more than a word processor, for less than most typewriters. The last part of the word processor to be perfected was the printer. The first sort to appear were dot matrix printers. These have a memory which stores the shape of each letter in patterns of ons and offs. Then inside the machine there's a device like this. The ons and offs are used to power a group of electromagnets which push